You're watching WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week. I'm Corey Nockreiner, CISSP, Director of Security Strategy for WatchGuard, and your host. Let's talk about the week starting Monday, March 12th. The second week of every month is Microsoft Patch Day, so the majority of this week's stories have to do with updates. Obviously, on Tuesday, Microsoft released their Patch Day. Uh, they posted six security bulletins, which fix vulnerabilities in, or seven vulnerabilities in uh, about three products. Four of the vulnerabilities affected Windows. The most critical and the one you should pay attention to was a serious vulnerability in uh, Windows's remote desktop protocol. This is the protocol that allows you to remotely gain f access to a desktop and actually control a computer's desktop somewhere else. It's also the protocol that terminal servers use to allow many uh, users to share one computer. Well, anyways, there was a serious vulnerability in this particular protocol. Basically, if you allow access access to remote desktop services or terminal services, an attacker, an unauthenticated attacker for that matter, can gain full access to that particular computer. The good news is there's no publicly known exploit for this vulnerability yet, but I suspect attackers right now are reverse engineering Microsoft's patches to find this exploit, this vulner uh, how to exploit this vulnerability. Furthermore, there's been some rumors that some Chinese hackers have actually uh, posted an exploit on on a forum page, but that forum has since been removed. In any case, if you re use remote desktop, you should definitely apply this patch. Uh, you can also use your firewall to limit access to port 3389, I believe, and 4125, which are the two uh, ports that remote desktop protocol tends to use. Uh, you can also enable some other Windows features that might help, but really your best bet is the patch. Besides these Windows vulnerabilities, Microsoft also released alerts for uh, Visual Studio, which is their development package, and uh, also Expression Studio, which is a program I hadn't heard about, but it's actually one of their vector diagram uh, designing packages. So if you have either of those products, you should patch them as well, but no, those vulnerabilities aren't quite as severe. Continuing along with updates this week, Apple also released a Safari update that fixes 83 security vulnerabilities in the popular Apple uh, Mac browser. So if you're a Mac user or you use Safari for Windows, definitely grab that. I'm guessing it fixes some of the pwn to own vulnerabilities that uh, Apple learned about last week. Finally, Adobe shares Microsoft Patch Day, but the good news is they really only released one semi-minor patch. They released an update for Cold Fusion. Uh, Cold Fusion is a web application server uh, program. It helps you create web applications, basically applications where your website can gain access to your database server and do neat dynamic things with your website. Cold Fusion really isn't a, a very popular technology today. Most developers today use PHP and ASP to create these type of database backend web applications. Nonetheless, some people do still use Cold Fusion. If you're one of those people, you should patch it. This patch fixes a denial of service vulnerability having to do with hash algorithm collisions. So not the, the worst vulnerability in the world, but if you want your e-commerce server to stay up and you use Cold Fusion, grab Adobe's patch. Other than all the security updates, this week's news was actually much quieter than the past few weeks have been. But there were some stories of note. On the breaches front, one of the big stories this week was the BBC network claiming that it's been suffering cyber attacks. According to their claim, they were getting some attacks that was knocking down their broadcast system in the Iran area, as well as a di distributed denial of service attacks targeting their London-based phone systems. It's unclear whether these were uh, old school PBX phone systems or voice over IP phone systems. In either case, they pretty much hinted towards Towards these attacks coming from Iran who may not like their particular broadcasts happening in their country. So they made a, a decent deal about these type of cyber attacks happening against their network. 
There were also a couple rumors of vulnerabilities in some websites as well. One of the things I saw on eHacking News, I'll share a link uh, in my post, was uh, some researcher actually disclosing a fact that he found a cross-site scripting flaw in the PayPal site. Now this post didn't share a lot of detail about the flaw, other than uh, he had talked to the vendor about it and it is not yet patched. Uh, it wasn't really shared uh, how much he could leverage this flaw to do no good. In any case, it's pretty disconcerting to know that PayPal may currently suffer from a cross-site scripting vulnerability. There was also some other news about a group called Team Havoc, who announced that it found some cross-site scripting and SQL injection vulnerabilities on the Ancestry.com webpage. Uh, this is a webpage that tracks family history. And they apparently got access to the database of this site, and they're talking about how dangerous having all that Ancestry information might be for the victims, the people that use this site. Finally, I'll round out this week's news with one anonymous related uh, news item. I didn't really want to focus on anonymous much this week, but there is one recent news item you might want to know about. Recently, a group claiming to be part of anonymous created a SourceForge project called Anonymous OS. This was a project for a Ubuntu distro that was claiming to be a prepackaged distro that had a lot of the tools Anonymous can use to DDoS and, and find SQL vulnerabilities and stuff like that. Well, recently some researchers who analyzed that distro found that it actually contained some Trojans and some infections of its own. So probably a bad distro for you to try even if you're an anonymous member. Uh, on Thursday, SourceForge actually removed this project. And SourceForge is pretty good about allowing many different projects on their particular web-based, you know, source repository. They're known for not letting people take down things like Metasploit and things that you might consider hacking projects. And yet they claim that Anonymous OS clearly was more than it was saying it was. It had some infections and some Trojans and they weren't willing to let their, you know, visitor base be infected by this project. So hopefully none of you out there are trying to download Anonymous OS to attack people. But if you were looking at Anonymous OS, be sure to be careful with it. It's probably an infected project. So that's it for this week's Security Week in Review. It was a pretty uh, quiet week compared to some others, so very, very quick update. As usual, if you like more regular uh, small updates about security stories, follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept. And be sure to keep on following WatchGuard Security Center where we post a bunch of security news as well. As usual, thanks for watching. And at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.